God bless you. You can be seated. Pastor Jay, you're not old. I've got ties older than you. <laughs> uh, I heard this story about these two drunken cowboys that came out of the saloon about the same time as an old prospector was tying his mule up to the hitching post. And they had their guns out, and they said to the prospector, Old man, can you dance? He said, No, I don't do much dancing. And they said, Well, you're going to dance today. <laughs> Took their six shooters, and they began to shoot into the ground, and he began to dance pretty good. <laughs> Meanwhile, he was counting the bullets in the guns. And when their six shooters were emptied, he leaned over to his, ho to his mule and pulled out a shot-off so shotgun. And he laid it on the bridge of the nose of one of these cowboys who sobered up rather quickly. <laughs> Said to him, cowboy, have you ever kissed a mule? <laughs> cowboy said, no, but I have always wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're saying to the devil tonight, devil, have you ever kissed a mule? We're having healing tonight. Yeah. Now, if you want to be sick, then let me give you mine so you could have a double portion. Okay. People have a tendency to claim their sickness. You think you're sick, let me tell you about my sickness. They take personal possession of it, and they, they milk it, and they get attention by it. No, you can have mine. <laughs> you have all of it. Praise God. Well, get your Bibles. Uh, I don't care where you open it to. Just get them. <laughs> and oh, by the way, uh, by the way, if you want to connect with me on social media, there it is. Don't ask me what all that means. Uh, get your, you might want to get your, your mobile out and take a, a snapshot of that, take a picture of that, uh, whatever you want to take of it, you know. Uh, their Facebook, uh, we do Facebook, my wife and I do Facebook each week on Wednesday mornings, uh, early Wednesday mornings, I do live Facebook, she does hers on Thursday, I'll be doing mine this week from here. And wherever I am in the world, when I was in Nigeria, I did it, when I was in uh, Australia, I did it, when I was in Singapore, when I did it, I did it in Korea this year. Uh, also, uh, Twitter, uh, at Richard Roberts. Dot, uh, o -R, R, R, Richard, I'll get it in a minute. I'll read it right. Richard Roberts. Uh, never mind. You know, you read it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I didn't grow up with all this stuff. My kids are trying to teach me, you know. And they said, to have people tag you. And I said, you're it, tag, you know. <laughs> that wasn't what they meant. And then there's, uh, what is that next one down there? That's with the bird. What is that? It's what? That's Twitter? What in the world is Twitter? I'm on it, whatever it is. And then YouTube, we have our own YouTube channel. So take those down. You can connect with us. Praise God for that. The thousands of people that are following us. I'm not sure what that means, but they're out there. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Bye. Oh, glory. Well, it's Sunday night in Cedar Rapids. Hallelujah. <laughs> Buckle up your seatbelt. Man. Wow. can't feel that you're dead <laughs> and you need a resurrection yeah. and the good news is you're at the right place tonight yeah. well be seated if you can <laughs> hallelujah 
Hallelujah. You might want to get something to write on tonight. Um, I've got quite a number of scriptures to give you, and I'll give you an opportunity to jot them down. Don't try to write out the scripture, but just write down the, the verse. And let me just uh, minister you tonight out of my heart. Uh, someone has an enlarged lip. One of your lips is enlarged. It's infected, or you hit something, or something has struck you in your lip, and you're being healed right now, and your your lips going down to normal size. I don't know who you are. That's an unusual word of knowledge, but it's happening right now. Praise God. I was on television one night back in the years when we were doing our program live, and I heard myself say. Uh, uh, there's a, a woman who is pregnant, and she's going to have to, uh, the doctor is going to have to take the child because she has, the woman has cancer. And uh, to save her life, going to have to take, uh, take, take the child. And I said, the Lord is healing you of the cancer right now. And I was on live, live television that night. I did, we did our program for, oh my goodness, many years, live, Monday through Friday night. And uh, I said, uh, Said, I gave the word, and I said, whoever you are, make contact with me. And uh, the next day, we got a call from a woman up in the, on the East Coast, and she said, um, I came into my house just at the time that my mother was watching you on television. And uh, as I came in, you gave that word of knowledge. And she said, I had just come from the doctor. I'm pregnant, and the doctors have diagnosed cancer in me, and he's going to have to take the child. And when you gave that word, my mother and I, went into faith, into an agreement. And it's been, uh, and, and, and she, she uh, let, contacted us again in a few days and, it, and went back to the doctor. And the doctor said, we don't know what happened, but there's not a trace of cancer in your body. And we followed her. We followed her over the months, and she delivered a perfectly normal, healthy child. So thank God for the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. Now, now, Lord, you're already taking me in a different direction than I intended to go tonight. I, you know. <laughs> oh, that'll be just fine. That'll be just fine. Uh, yeah, 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 hold that a minute. Uh, somebody right over here, you got pain in your elbow. Who are you? Where are you? You got pain right here in your arm. You're right in this area. Where are you? You got pain in your arm, one of your arms. Who is it? Well, you're not in this section, but come on over here a minute. Sometimes I miss it, you know, a few feet. <laughs> is it you? Well, come on down here. I'm not going to bite, I promise. Which arm is it? Is it right arm? Where does it hurt? Yeah, does it go up into your shoulder too? Uh, no. No? Okay. In the authority. There it is. There's your healing right now in Jesus' name. Now just start doing what you could not do. Whatever you could not do, just move it. Yeah. Now move it up and down. Is it okay now? Yeah. You sure? It was bruised earlier. It was what? It was bruised earlier. It was bruised? Yeah. How about now? No, it feels good. It's gone? Pain's gone? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. It's going a different way. <laughs> Man once said to me, how does the word of knowledge work? You know, and I was... I had preached that night. I was in England, and I was up in the city of Birmingham, and I would preached that night, and there was a big crowd. And there was a girl, a teenager, uh, who had uh, broken her leg, and after they took the cast off, the leg was, was crooked, had not grown back properly, had not healed properly. And she had a big brace on her leg, and she was so discouraged because the, the, the leg had not healed properly, and she had this brace that went from here all the way down. And God gave me a word of knowledge for her, and... She came down to the platform, took her brace off, and went running up and down the aisle, her leg perfectly straight, perfectly normal. It was just a wonderful miracle. And the, Brit the British people who are very non-demonstrative people, you know, they're, they're very staid and calm, and they're unlike the people of Iowa. <laughs> you know. Some people say Iowa has the conscience of the nation, you know. What the way Iowans feel is is how the country feels. So I take this I take being here very serious. Okay. As do a lot of politicians in the near future. So this reporter from the BBC was there 
and he wanted to interview me after the service, and I could see him over there making his notes, and I could tell the scowl on his face. I knew it was not going to be a pretty article. But I had given my word to him that I would let him interview me. So afterwards, we sat down together, and he started asking me questions. And his first question was, how does the word of knowledge work? Well, the Bible says that the carnal, that uh, carnal, how's that scripture? Uh, uh, natural man has a carnal, anyway, uh, I can't think of the scripture that, that came to my mind. But, but um, I, I knew I didn't know how to explain it to him in a way that he would understand it. The carnal mind is at enmity with God. That's, that's the scripture. And so I was struggling in how to answer his question because I didn't know how he would write it when I said it. When all of a sudden the Lord said, well, don't answer his question. Just ask him how long he's had pain in his shoulder. And I said to him, how long have you had this pain? He said, well, I've had it for several years. How did you know about it? And I said, well, if you'll just take your shoulder and your arm and move it now, you're going to find the pain that you've had for three years is gone. And he began to move his arm, and a big smile came on his face. He said, what did you do? I said, I answered your question. That's how the word of knowledge works. Just like that. Word of knowledge just works. We were on TV one night, and I said, there's a man watching me right now. I don't know where you are, but you're watching me right now. And uh, back in the Vietnam War, uh, you... Uh, you lost uh, the use of three of your fingers on your hand, and they're, they're, they're numb, and, and you have no feeling. And uh, God's healing your fingers. Your, your fingers have been numb since the 1960s. Well, it's a pretty specific word of knowledge, I mean, you know. And sure enough, a man from Nashville was watching, and he called uh, later that night while we were still on the air, and he said, I don't know how you knew about me, but, but I, I, I injured, uh, I, I severed the nerves in three of my fingers as a soldier in Vietnam during the 1960s, and I've had no feeling in those fingers for all these years. Now, that was, that was in, the, in the 90s when that happened, so he'd have been 30 years with no feeling in those fingers. And he said, uh, he said I could actually take my, my fingers and hit it into a post and feel nothing. And he said, when you said that, though, suddenly tingling came into those three fingers, and now suddenly I not only have full movement, but I have complete feeling back in my fingers again. Well, that's an operation of the word of knowledge. That's how the word of knowledge works. Now, with all the great doctors, and thank God for them, with all the great medicines that are being discovered, thank God for that, with all the great uh, clinicians and uh, hospitals and clinics, thank God for all of that. But with all that, people seem to be sicker than they've ever been. If ever there was a time for healing, there's a time for healing now. And we find healing all the way through the Scriptures. Uh, if, you, if you have your Bible out tonight... Uh, just make a, make a few notes as we go along, and let me just give you uh, kind of an overview. I'm kind of an overview kind of preacher. I like to build a superstructure, firm foundation, then I like to take it up, and then I like to top it off. I learned that from somebody down the way. And so let me just share some things with you, and let me give you the benefit of some of my experience tonight, all right? So I'll go three or four different directions, and we'll build about three towers out of this base. Okay. <laughs> so let's start with the, with the let's start with Exodus, 15 and 26. Yeah. I am the Lord that healeth thee. Thank God for doctors. Thank God for climate. Thank God for exercise. Thank God for good health habits. Thank God for good eating. But the Lord said, "I am the Lord who heals you." You thank the person who prays. You thank the doctor who treats and medicates and does surgery. You thank the one who gives you the diet, the climate, the exercise. You thank them, but you give praise to God. Amen. When I get a headache, I pray, and I take two Tylenol. I don't really care which one works. <laughs> Matters not. I just give the glory to him. Because yeah. he's the source of both. Now, there are some people who want to tie one of God's hands behind his back and say, God, this is the only way that you can do it. But who do you think you are to tell God his business? Now, I don't know about you, but I've told God how to do it. I've told him when to do it, where to do it, and who to do it to. He's never done it my way once. 
Exodus 15, 26. I am the Lord that healeth thee. And you find healing. Let's start with the Old Testament. You find healing all the way through the Old Testament. You find in Genesis 20, in Genesis 20 verses 1 through 18, you see the story of Abraham, how he prayed for Abimelech, and God healed him. That's in Genesis 20. Uh, verses 1 through 18. I was in the hotel room this afternoon going all, over all these scriptures for you tonight. Then in Numbers, in Numbers 12, verses 1 through 15, God healed Moses' sister, Miriam, of leprosy. Okay? So it doesn't seem to bother him if it's male or female. He does healing. All right? Then in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 9 through 20, he healed Sarah's barrenness. Okay? That means he can heal women who can't have children. Then in 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 through 24, it's the story of Elijah raising the widow's son. And that great miracle. And then it's repeated in 2 Kings chapter 5 when Elisha raises the Shunammite woman's son. Now, Elisha was a protege of Elijah and asked for a double portion of the spirit that rested upon Elijah. And he got it. And that's what you heard me talk about this morning. I wanted a double portion of the spirit that had been upon my father or Roberts. All right, then over in, in Daniel, in chapter 4, God does an unusual thing. He heals Nebuchadnezzar of his insanity. You know, after Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he went insane. Literally. Crawling around on the, on, the, on the ground for some period of time. Fingernails growing out 10 miles long, you know. And God healed him. That means God can heal about anybody he chooses. Some of the greatest miracles I have seen have come in the lives of people who get healed and then come into the altar call to get saved. Now, many Christians say, well, you can't get healed unless you're a Christian. Well, where's that in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. When Jesus healed a blind man, he met him again later and said, do you know who healed you? He said, no, but I want to. Some of the greatest miracles I have seen have come uh, in the lives of people who have not been Christians. But by the time the altar call comes, they're down here giving their hearts to the Lord. Because a miracle tenderizes your heart. When you see a miracle, it changes everything. So on and on and on, you can find Scripture after Scripture after Scripture in the Old Testament. Then you come to the New Testament, and you see Jesus continue the healing. For remember, the Scripture says, I am the Lord, I change not. Okay, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we, heal, we see Jesus healing. We see him healing the nobleman's son. We see him healing the Roman centurion's aid. When Jesus sent the word, we'll talk about that a little bit later on tonight. Uh, we see him healing the woman with the issue of blood. Who had had this uh, problem in her body for some 12 years and had spent all she had on doctors and was none bettered. But she touched the border of his garment which in those days the rabbis and Jesus was referred to as Rabboni or Rabbi and the rabbis in those days wore a certain type of outer prayer shawl and at the base of the shawl were tassels and the tassels were symbolic of the law of Moses which was the word of God I believe she was saying he doesn't have to touch me if I can just get my hands on the word of God I'll be healed I guess the point is, don't get your eyes on some man or some woman. Don't get your eyes. I remember Kenneth Copeland telling the story once that he went to lay hands on a, on a woman, and she said, oh, no, 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 don't lay your hands on me. I'm saving this for Oral Roberts. <laughs> How dumb can you get and still breathe? So we see the miracles throughout the New Testament through the life of Jesus. There are too many, too numerous. If, if all the miracles that he did were to be written down, the libraries wouldn't, fill, wouldn't uh, contain them. Yeah. Scripture says that. But the question is, does he still heal today? Yes. Now, much of the church today believes that miracles died out when the apostle died out. Right. Well, tell that to Sandra over here. Right. You know. right. Tell that to her. Tell her that miracles died out. You know. Tell it to that young woman who just got her arm, her, uh, her elbow healed. You know. 
Miracles have not gone out of style. Miracles have not gone out of business. Now tonight, I'm going to weave my own testimony of how God led me into the healing ministry. And I'm going to give you seven reasons why God heals today. And then I'm going to show you how to do what I do. Okay? So write this down. Seven reasons why Jesus heals today. Seven reasons why Jesus heals today. Are you ready? Number one, he heals because of compassion. Compassion. Everyone say compassion. Compassion is different than sympathy. Sympathy says, I'm so sorry. I wish there was something that I could do to help. But that's not compassion. Compassion is an irresistible urge to reach in and take hold of the problem and pull it out. The Bible says in Matthew 14, 14, that Jesus went forth. He saw a great multitude of people and he was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. Jesus moved with compassion. I think the most compassionate person I ever met in my life was my father. My father was so filled with compassion. He was violent in his faith against sickness. He hated sickness so much. And he was willing to pray for a person no matter who they were, no matter what they had done didn't make any difference to him. He was going to pray a prayer of faith. And I remember one night, I was in a crusade with him, and we were in a certain city, and his custom was, after he had preached, he would give an altar call. People would come forward to give their hearts to Christ. And then he would send those who got saved to an auxiliary tent, which we call the prayer tent, or the salvation tent. And they would go, and they would meet all the pastors, all the sponsoring pastors, because my father would be leaving town, and he did not want to leave those, those without a shepherd. So he would send them to the pastors so they could get into the churches. My dad was always very strong on building the church. Uh, the media did not pick up on that. Many Christians didn't pick up on that, but, but I knew what was going on. So that was his custom. And while his associate evangelist was, was organizing the prayer line, he would go to another tent, an auxiliary tent, which we called the invalid tent. And in that tent were people who were too sick to stand in the prayer line. And I'm talking about people on beds, on stretchers, on hospital gurneys. I'm talking about the foulest smelling sicknesses and diseases you can possibly imagine. It was like the pool of Bethesda. And every time I, I could, every time I was there, I would go with him into that room and he would lay hands on 30, 40, 50, sometimes 100 people even before the main prayer line in the main tent. And that was at a time when uh, the media was so heavy against him. Here he was trying to preach and pray for the sick and get people well. And he was just getting criticized from all, all over. Not only the media, but the Christian publications were coming against him so hard, calling him everything you can imagine. And he had just about had it up to here. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And we came into the little tent that night, and uh, there was a man who was uh, on a hospital gurney, and he was in the, the, the dying stages of cancer. I'll never forget it as long as I live. The smell of the cancer was so foul. It, if you've ever been near someone who is at the closing stages of cancer, the smell will almost drive you out of the room. And the smell of that cancer was so bad. And he walked over to pray for the man, and as he leaned forward, uh, the, the smell was so bad that my father just turned and vomited all over the floor, the sawdust floor and turned and walked out of the little tent and just left me, I was about nine or ten, just left me standing there. And I didn't know what to do. A minute or two later, he came back in. Walked right back over to the man, got up on the hospital gurney with him, put his arms around him, prayed for his healing. I'd never seen anything like that before. And I never knew what the real story was for many, many years. And right after my mother went home to be with the Lord, I went out to California to spend a few days with my dad after the memorial service. And we were sitting there one night and we were reminiscing, talking about those days and recalling some of the great miracles that we had witnessed. And 
And that subject came up. And I said, Dad, I never understood. You vomited and then you left. You left me by myself. <laughs> but a moment or two later, you came back in, you took the man in your arms, and you held him close and you prayed for him. What happened? My dad smiled. He said, well, Richard, the, the media, the press, and the Christian publications were so heavy against me. I just had it. I, I just had it. And the smell of that cancer and the vomiting, he said, I just said to the Lord, I can't do this anymore. I quit. I'm done. He said, that's when I walked out of the tent. I said, yeah, but Dad, in a moment or two, you came back. And you took the man in your arms. He smiled and nodded his head. He said, yes, that's right. He said, when I got outside the tent and I said to the Lord, I quit, the Lord spoke to me. <laughs> I said, well, what did he say? He said, he said to me, Oral Roberts, if you're not willing to lay hands on him and pray for him, then you're not worthy to be my child. And he said, that's when I came back in, took the man in my arms, held him, and prayed for him. Now that's compassion. Compassion is an irresistible urge to reach in and take hold of a problem. Pull it out changing planes in Dallas and I was going to catch the tram to go from one terminal to the next and as I was going up the three story elevator e escalator there was a woman coming down and she recognized me and she started yelling she said I've got cancer pray for me the people on this side people on her side everybody's listening she's yelling at the top of her voice and I said we're going to pass in a minute and when we do, stretch out your faith. I'm going to lean over and touch you. Everybody's watching. Everybody's staring now. Because I'm yelling back. Here she comes. She's coming this way. I'm coming this way. And we got, we got real close. And I said, now reach out your hand real close. And I leaned over my part of the railing and touched her. Be healed in Jesus' name. She went, whoo, whoo. I'm healed, I'm healed. People looked at me like I was crazy, you know. <laughs> like I was out of my mind. No, I wasn't out of my mind. Well, I was out of my mind. <laughs> I was just into my spirit, you know. That's compassion. Makes you want to remove the problem. Number two. Healing is the children's bread. It's another reason he heals. Healing is the children's bread. Healing is a scriptural reference, or the children's bread is a scriptural reference to healing. When the woman with the demon-possessed daughter came to him in Matthew 15, and the disciples said, send her away, she cries and whines and gripes too much. And Jesus wouldn't talk to her. And then it seemed like he insulted her when he said, I'm not sent to you. I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she kept on after him until finally he said, it's not right to take the children's bread which is healing and cast it before dogs he literally called her a dog now in this social world that we live in with our political correctness you know what would happen if I call somebody a dog especially a woman to her face I'd be all over the Cedar Rapids newspaper tomorrow morning if I called you a dog but he wasn't referring to her. He was referring to the animalistic way in which she lived. She was a pagan. She came from the coasts of Lebanon. And they worshipped the, 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 the false prophet or false uh, god, Baal. Had been ushered in to Israel through, through uh, King Ahab and his wicked wife, Jezebel. And they were nomadic people and they lived like wild animals. And he said, it's not right to take healing and cast it before someone who lives like a wild animal. That's what he was saying. Healing is the children's bread. And she said, you know what? You're right. You're right, Jesus. I am a dog. But even the little dogs in Israel get to eat the scraps from the master's table. She knew the custom of the Jews. The custom was that the family had a little dog. And the dog would sit on the lap of the master of the house. 
He would feed the scraps. And she was saying, you don't have to do much. Just give me a crumb. Yeah. Yeah. Just give me a crumb. That's all I need. Let my faith do the rest. One night, we were in a crusade, and a woman, African-American woman, brought her little boy in for prayer. He looked to be maybe a year or two older than me. And he had on metal crutches and metal braces down his legs. His hip was all sunken in, and it was flat. And the woman handed the prayer card to my father, and it read that the little boy had been born without a hip socket. I don't mean it had deteriorated. I mean, he didn't have one. And his hip was all sunken in like this, and he couldn't walk without the aid of the metal crutches and the braces on his legs. And I'll never forget, my father looked at her and said, Ma'am, I am so sorry. I just do not have faith for a creative miracle. This healing is going to have to wait until the resurrection. I remember it like it was yesterday. The woman took the microphone and said to my father, Oral Roberts, I don't ask you to have any faith at all. You just pray and I will do the believing. Never forget it. He said, well, all right. And he prayed for the little boy, and it looked like nothing happened. But the next night, when they got to the tent, Brother Deweese, my dad's associate evangelist, had the little boy and his mother up on the platform. He did not have any crutches, or no braces on his legs. And he was running and jumping, and the crowd was cheering. And my father walked up on the platform and put his hand on the spot where he had laid it last night. And in the night, God had created a hip socket. Just give me a crumb, she was saying. That's all I need. And what did Jesus say? Woman... Great is your faith. Only one other time in the Bible is that phrase used. In the Roman centurion. Only twice. And neither one of them were members of the church. <laughs> Healing is the children's bread. Reason number three. To fulfill the prophecy of healing in the atonement. To fulfill the prophecy of healing in the atonement. Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes you were healed. Back in the early 1970s, my dad hired the great old actor Burl Ives to come on our television program. He was always one of my favorite actors. I can see him today in, the, in this, that great movie, The Big Country, starring him and uh, Burl Ives and Charles Bickford and Chuck Connors and uh, uh, Gregory Peck and all these, these great actors and actresses. I just, I love that Western movie. I just, I love Westerns anyway, you know. I grew up reading Louis L'Amour novels. And so I love, I, I, and when he came on, uh, my dad brought him on and they dressed him up in, the, in, in period costume like what you would expect Isaiah to look like. And with his bald head and with his uh, with the hair down the back, you know, and his beard, he looked exactly like what you thought Elijah would look like. <laughs> and he was a spirit-filled Christian, which many people didn't know. And he quoted this passage on camera. He was wounded for our transgressions. I'll tell you, there was not a dry eye at NBC that day. No one could say a word as he gave this message. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. He heals to fulfill prophecy. And also the prophecy in um, Matthew 8, verses 16 and 17, was fulfilled as well. Himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. Then 
Doctrine number four, he heals to reveal his Father's glory. God gets glory out of our lives when he heals us. Matthew 15, verses 30 and 31 says that when he healed the people, they in turn gave glory to God. Healing brings glory. Brother Hagin used to say, healing is the dinner bell. And when you ring the dinner bell with healing, people come running to give their hearts to Christ. Some of the greatest altar calls I've ever witnessed have happened after a great healing. I was preaching in Jos, Nigeria, in your home country. And um, I gave a word of knowledge that night about someone who was crippled. I didn't know who it was. I often do not know who it is. I just have a word. And there were about 15 to 20, maybe, maybe 25,000 people there that night on a big soccer field. Everyone was standing around the platform out in the middle of that field. And I gave this word of knowledge that someone crippled was being healed. And I continued to pray for others, and a young man came through the crowd, and people began to cheer. And he came up on the platform, and he would run and jump and squat down and run and jump and squat down. And I said to my interpreter, what is happening here? Because the people were rejoicing. It looked like I was the only one that didn't know who he was. Now, when you get 20,000 Africans jumping up and down, it <laughs> feels like the whole earth is moving. And uh, the, the interpreter told me that everyone in town knew this young man. He was about 20 years old. He had never walked a step in his life. His parents carried him to the post office where he begged for money. Everyone in town knew him except me. And when... I saw him running and jumping. Suddenly, I began to run and jump <laughs> and rejoice. And the media was there, uh, primarily to criticize me. And um, I invited the media to come up on the platform and take his testimony. And the next day, the front page of the newspaper of Jos carried the story, Beggar of Jos Healed. And that next night, 100,000 people came to hear me preach. And 25,000 Muslims gave their hearts to the Lord. And God received the glory. Number five, he healed, he heals to prove his mission. John 10, verses 37 and 38. Jesus said, if I do not do the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I do the works, even if you don't believe, believe me for the very work's sake so that you may know that the Father is in me and I am in him. Amen. He heals to prove his mission. That's why he came. And that's what he says to us. He said to his disciples, go preaching, teaching, and healing. Thank God for the preaching of the word. Nothing will ever take the place of the preaching. For it's the preaching of the word that draws men and women unto repentance brings conviction yes, thank God for teaching yes. we have to be taught yes. half of the New Testament or more is about teaching the Apostle Paul teaches us how to live a Christian life thank God for preaching thank God for teaching but if that's all you got then you have a two thirds gospel yes. to have a full gospel there have got to be miracles yes. Jesus preached and he taught and he healed has got to be the confirmation of the word. Amen. That's why preaching and teaching and healing are so important. I remember when Lindsay and I first got married, um, I want you all to meet her someday, because when you do, you'll forget about me. <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe a while before I bring her. Uh, <laughs> but she used to like a certain kind of drink at those convenience stores, you know, the get and go, quick trip, come and go type place. She liked one-third hot water, one-third hot coffee, and one-third hot chocolate. You know, didn't float my boat, you know. <laughs> Give me a Dr. Pepper, and I'm happy. Nectar, nectar of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> there was some in my hotel room last night, and I rejoiced and was glad. <laughs> But she liked one-third hot water, one-third hot chocolate, one-third hot coffee. And she would say, could I have a third, a third, a third? Well, I knew what she meant. 
she wanted me to stop the car and get her half, you know, a third water, third chocolate, third coffee. And one time I went in there and they were out of hot chocolate. And so I gave her half water and half coffee. And I put the lid on it and I got one of those kind of little tiny, tiny straws. You know the kind? If you get anything out, you got to suck your brains out. You know what I'm... A little tiny straw. You know what I mean? Put it in there, handed it to her, didn't say a word. She took one sip. She said, this is not a third, a third, a third. I said, really? She said, this is half, half. I said, how do you know? I can tell, she said. Preaching, teaching, and healing. That's the full gospel. It's more than three points in a poem and a handshake. Got to have the power of God. There were a lot of preachers in that day. The only one with miracles was named Jesus. Preaching, teaching, and healing. He healed to, to prove his mission. Number six, he heals to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8 says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Sickness and disease is a work of the enemy. Sickness is not your friend. Sickness is death reaching out its icy hand to kill you, to steal from you, to destroy the memory that you were ever born. Satan is not your friend. And every demon in hell will do everything possible to put everything they possibly can on you. But we have a Savior yes. who has a name that's above and he's given us the right to use his name. Yes. On the last night of his earthly life, he gathered his disciples around the campfire and said, up until now, you've asked nothing in my name. That's John 16, 24. Ask, he said, and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Up to that point, they had heard him cry, Abba, Father. They had heard him call on his Father for healing. But now, he's transferring the power to them. He's giving them the power of attorney to use his name. When Lindsay and I got married, she was no longer referred to as Lindsay Salem from Flushing, Michigan, by way of Florida. She became Mrs. Richard L. Roberts. She no longer went by Lindsay Salem. She went by Lindsay Roberts. I transferred the flag. I gave her the right to use my name. She took my name. And pretty soon she knew how to use it on credit cards. <laughs> and on checks. And no matter where I was in the world, she could use my name, and it was just like I was standing next to her. She learned pretty quickly how to use it. And Jesus has given us his name. The authority to speak to demonic forces and command them in the name of Jesus. You take your dirty, rotten, stinking, filthy hands off because I belong to God. Satan, you can't have my family. You can't have my finances. You can't have my health. You can't have my emotions. You can't have my relations. You can't have my, my marriage. You can't have my children. You can't have me. Because I belong to God. You have the right to use that name. And then number seven. He heals to prove that he is the Messiah. John 3, 16 and 17, the scriptures that I learned on my father's knee when I was a boy. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that, that's that divine destiny, so that men and women would not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's the mission of the Messiah. Saving, healing, delivering Jesus. Maybe someone knows a different Jesus, but the one I know has healing, has miracles. Now, as I told you, 
I started out my life uh, in, the, in the healing ministry with my father, even though I was just a boy. And he would allow me to come up on the platform and stand by him often when he prayed for the sick. And his custom was, on the last day of the crusade, uh, after, uh, or when it came to an end, everyone who had a prayer card and desired hands laid upon them and had not yet been prayed for would receive the prayer of faith and he would do it personally. And sometimes it was not unusual for there to be five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand for him to lay hands on in the closing service. And whenever I was allowed, I would walk those prayer lines with him. And after a few minutes, uh, he'd take off his coat because he would get hot and sweating because most of his crusades in the tent were, you know, obviously outdoors and there was no air conditioning and it was hot summertime. And I remember I was about eight or nine years old and we were in Trenton, New Jersey. And they were having a heat wave. It was 100 degrees in, in New Jersey. And under the tent, it must have been 120. And they had raised the tent flaps, but there was no wind. It didn't help. And on the last day of that crusade, there were 9,000 that still had a prayer card. And I walked those lines with him for three and a half hours, carrying his coat while he prayed for the sick until he literally collapsed. And we had to physically carry him to the car. He paid the price. And I grew up under that, learning about the healing ministry. And oftentimes he would stop and say, Richard, you touch them. And I didn't know what to do. I just did what I saw him do. Amen. And that's a good formula for you. Just do what you see Jesus doing. Yes. That's how I got my start, my kickstart in the healing ministry. But as I shared this morning, I went away from all of that. But when I came back to God at 19, suddenly the healing ministry and, and preaching began to open up into me and I was much more open. But it took years, it took years. And I remember in 1977, I was a guest on the uh, Praise the Lord program down in Charlotte. And uh, I was with the host and I was ministering and they introduced a woman to come out on the program. And I had never met her, but I knew that she was a fake. I did not like her. I did not want to be on the same program with her. I did not want to be identified with her because I thought she was a fake. And here she was coming on live national television to sit down next to me. I was very uncomfortable. And she sat down and I scooted over in my chair as far as I could get away from her. I was stuck. And at the end of the program, after she was interviewed, the host asked me to pray. And I prayed a general prayer. And then he asked her to pray. And instead of praying, she began to prophesy over me. And she began to talk about the word of knowledge, which my father had prophesied over me some years before. She began to describe how the Lord would use me in the healing ministry, particularly through the word of knowledge, like he is right now with the person who has the growth on the top of your leg. Whoever you, you've got a growth or a boil or something, a tumor on the top of your leg, and you're being healed right now. If you stand up, you're going to find the tumor's gone. And she was prophesying what I just did. And I was, I mean, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I was shocked. First of all, that it came out of her. You know. And so when the program was over and we went back behind the, the stage into the green room there, I, I called her over and I said, I, I'm so sorry, I owe you an apology. She said, Why? I said, Because I don't like you. <laughs> um, honesty is a trait of the Roberts family. <laughs> and speaking right at you is another one too. Holding nothing back. You, in these days, you're going to learn that about me. I, I said, I don't like you. And I said, I thought you were a fake. And God has shown me that I'm wrong. And I want to apologize from, the, from my heart. Please forgive me for what I thought. And uh, every word that she prophesied that day began coming to pass. But it took more time. It took three more years. And during those three years, I was being schooled in faith, learning, studying preparing. You know, I'm an, I was an overnight 40-year-old success, you know. <laughs> Everybody wants it quickly. I highly suspicion things that come too quickly. You know. Yes, there are a lot of instantaneous miracles, but most of the healings I have seen have come over a period of time. And I think that's so people don't lose them. It's easier to lose a healing when it comes too quickly. Thank God there are instantaneous miracles, and we've seen them. Right. Saw that with your shoulder. 
and there are a lot of those, but most of the miracles I see come over a period of time. So I was schooled during those three years, and, and uh, Lindsay and I got a hold of the scripture in Mark 11, 24, which says, What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Our desire was a healing ministry. And so we began to confess that scripture. We asked the Lord for a healing ministry that the word that had been prophesied over me numerous times would actually come to pass. We felt like we were prepared. And we didn't tell anybody about it. We didn't announce it on television. I didn't tell my parents. Uh, she didn't tell her mother. We didn't tell anybody. We just kept it to ourselves. But each day, we thanked the Lord for the healing ministry that was on the way. Day after day, week after week, month after month, we just kept calling it in by faith. Just kept calling it in by faith. Just kept calling it in by faith. And I was preaching and I was praying for people, but there weren't any miracles. But I just calling it in. I just kept calling it in. I believed I had it by faith. And I was waiting for God to give the manifestation. And faith is what you hold on to until you receive what you're believing for. So I held on. And a few months went by, and we went out uh, to on the road to preach. We were in several cities that week, and uh, one of them was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And something told me in my spirit that there was going to be a change that night. I didn't know what it was, but I, I, was, I was, it was like I was on, on the edge of something. I knew something was about to happen. I could feel it. I didn't know how, but I knew something. Sometimes you're in your spirit, you know something. And I got out on the platform, and uh, I, 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 words began to come out of my mouth that I'd never said before. Words that did not come out of my mind, but came out of my spirit. And I began praying in a different manner than I had ever prayed before. And suddenly people began to get healed. I remember a, a Japanese woman that night who had lost hearing in one ear as a result of being a survivor of the, of the Holocaust in Japan during World War II in the, the bombing of Nagasaki with the atomic war, the atomic bomb. And she was well outside the city, but it, 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 it damaged her hearing as a child. And God healed her that night. She was in the service, and her hearing was restored. She hadn't heard in that ear since she was a little girl. And there was a man who was blind that was healed that night. And there was a woman, I remember, who was in a walker and in a wheelchair, and God healed her, and she came out and went running around, around the building. And, and I actually received the anointing to pray for the sick and with the manifestation of it in the same way that God said it would come. And he's been doing that wherever I have gone ever since. Now that was 1980. And uh, God has healed someone in every service I have preached in since that day. And usually not just one or two, but lots of people. That's how God uses me. God uses me through a word of knowledge. My father had a laying on of hands ministry. And in order for him to, to be fulfilled, he had to get his right hand on you. And brother, sister, when he got his right hand on you, you felt like you'd put your hand in an electric light socket. The power of God could knock you across the room. And I've seen people literally fly across the room when he laid hands on them. It's a very, very strong manifestation. It was a sign that was given to him. But God didn't give me that sign. The sign God gave me was through my voice and that I would speak the word and people would be healed. And that's now, let me shift gears now. Let's, let me start sermon number three, okay? <laughs> Remember, I'm building a superstructure, okay? I gave you all the scriptures, and then I talked about, about uh, the seven reasons that Jesus heals, and I began to give you my own testimony. Well, now we're going to top it off now with showing you how to do what I do because it's not right that Christians should look only to the pastor and to the evangelist. Amen. It's not scriptural. Because the scripture says, you shall lay hands on the sick. Now, the typical Christian might say, well, that's what the Bible says, but that was for, you know, that was for the disciples. Well, okay, I'll accept that. John tells us, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciple. Now, you may not be Peter, you may not be Paul, you may not be John, you may not be one of those, but I got news, they're dead. They're not here. 
You and I are his modern day disciples today. Don't be looking for Peter and Paul. They're not here. We are his disciples today. And he said, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now the question is asked, why don't more Christians pray for the sick? Well, in my opinion, the major reason is because of intimidation. People are intimidated primarily because they don't know what to do. And mainly they're afraid of failing. Let me ask you this question. If you pray for someone, do you think because you pray they'll get sicker? What have you got to lose? I think the thing that people loved the most about my father was he was willing to pray under no matter what the circumstances were. He had a lot of failures. A lot of people were not healed that he prayed for. A lot of people died. But a lot of people were healed. I got my wife because of my father's prayers. My father, in 1968, prayed for a man by the name of Harry Salem, who was a Lincoln Mercury dealer in Flint, Michigan. He had cancer. And someone who worked for him in his dealership knew someone in Tulsa who worked for my dad and prevailed upon my dad to call Mr. Harry Salem, who was the youngest uh, national president of the Automobile Dealers Association of America. My dad called him, led him to the Lord on the phone, prayed for him, but he died. But the family never forgot the only man who prayed a healing prayer. Their pastor said, why don't you just let him die in dignity? But Oral Roberts called and prayed a prayer of faith, and the man's widow never forgot and wrote letters and became a partner with our ministry, praying that God would provide the right husband for her middle daughter. <laughs> now, you're slow, but you're worth waiting on. <laughs> Her middle daughter's name was Lindsay. <laughs> and she found a good husband. <laughs> and he found a good wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. Yeah. How do you overcome the intimidation factor? He said, well, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with my hands. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to. And that's mainly the reason why most Christians don't pray for the sick. They don't want to look bad. They don't want to fail. They, they don't want people criticizing them. And, they, and so they don't, want to get in, they don't want to get into the fray. They don't know what to do. I, I, don't, I don't know how to pray for someone. My dear Nigerian brother, come up here just a minute. If I were one of you ushers, come back here and help me. If I were to, if I were to, to pray for my brother because something was afflicting him, I would probably try to find out what it was. And then I would set myself, I would set my faith. And I would not lay hands on him until I was ready to let my faith go. Most of the time when I pray for people I, I, and I lay hands on them, which I do occasionally, I normally would put my hands perhaps by their neck or maybe on their shoulders. I'm a gentleman. I'm always careful where I touch people. You've got a brain. You need to use it. God gave us a brain. Yes. But I, I, I would wait until I was ready to release my faith. And I would say something like this. In the authority of Jesus' name, my brother, I lay my hands on you. I come against this satanic attack. Be healed in the name of Jesus. <laughs> that's powerful, isn't it? <laughs> well, now, that's, that's not me. That's him. All of us have that kind of anointing in Jesus' name. Now, everybody stand up and pair up. Stand up and pair up. You and one other person and face them. I'm going to give you a lesson in how to lay hands on the sick. Because when I finish with you, you're not going to be intimidated any longer. Are you ready? Don't touch them yet. Don't touch them. Now, when you lay your hands on them, don't just indiscriminately walk over and just lay your hand on them. 
wait until you're ready to release your faith. Now, you don't have to use these exact words, but pray after this fashion. Use it as a model. Remember when Jesus taught the disciples the Lord's Prayer, he didn't say you have to quote it verbatim. He said, pray after this fashion. You don't have to use those exact words, but he gave us a formula. Our Father, which art in heaven. He said, pray after this fashion. So you don't have to use these exact words, but something like this. Father, in Jesus' name, I come against this satanic attack in the name of Jesus. Satan, take your hands off, and I pray for healing. Something like that, okay? Now, you put it in your own words, but use that as a formula. Now, get your hands up. When I count to three, you're going to lay hands on them, and you're going to rebuke the devil, and you're going to pray for healing in Jesus' name. Not in your name, because you don't have any healing power. So you're going to pray in Jesus' name. Are you ready? When I count to three, start praying for them and lay your hands on them. Are you ready? One, two, three. Begin. Father, in the name of Jesus, I lay my hands on this man, on this woman. You foul, tormenting sickness, disease, fear, doubt, problem, whatever it is, come out. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, turn back this way. I want you to remember, it is not the length of your prayer. Okay? It's the sincerity of your heart. Now, find somebody else. Find somebody else and face them. I have done this with pastors all over the world. Are you ready? Put your hands up. On the count of three. One, two, three. Begin. Father, in Jesus' name, I lay hands on them. I rebuke this satanic attack. Every pain, every problem, come out in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now come back this way. Remember, it's not the length of your prayer. It's the sincerity of your heart. I mean, there are people in this world who are praying for three hours without any results because they're not using the name of Jesus. they got some false religion going. Now, I want you to watch what's going to happen. You're going to be amazed. I want to see the hand of everyone who said, I felt the power of God when somebody just touched me. Now, hold your hand up. Now, look around. Look around. Are you watching? Are you looking? Now, Let's brad the nail on the other side. Find one more person. Let's do it one more time. You're getting more comfortable with it now. You're getting more comfortable. Get your hands up. Are you ready? One, two, three. Begin. Father, in Jesus' name, I rebuke this thing. Come out and come off and enter again no more forever and ever and ever amen now come on back to me come on come on back remember it's not the length of your prayer now watch this how many of you now can say, I just felt the power of God when somebody laid hands on me? Put your hand up. Hold, hold it up high. Hold it up high. Look at that. Look at the hands. Now, everybody raise your right hand. Repeat after me. Never again, Never again. Will, I be intimidated will I be intimidated to lay my hands on someone my hands on and, pray the of and pray the prayer of faith. Because it's not me. Because it's not me. It's Jesus. He is the healer. I'm just the instrument. 
He is the healer. He is the healer. And I'll never be intimidated again. I'll never be intimidated again. Now I give the Lord a shout of praise. Be seated. Now, there are times when it would not be appropriate to lay hands on someone. There are times when it might not be accepted or it might be misunderstood. And so there is another method. It's not any better. It's just different. Same result. It's not called laying hands on people. It's called speaking the word. That's what Jesus did with the Roman centurion. You remember the story? The centurion said, you don't have to come lay your hands on my soldier. You just speak the word. Because I have authority given me by Caesar. And I tell my soldiers to do this, and they do it. To go here, to go there, they do it. But he said, I, I recognize, Jesus, that you have authority above all authority. And you don't have to come lay your hands on him. You just speak the word. Send the word. And my military aid will be healed. And Jesus marveled. He said, I've not seen such great faith. He was saying to Jesus, just send the word. I was telling you all earlier that I came into this uh, social media generation late. You know, I didn't understand all that stuff. You know, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have fax machines. We didn't have uh, cordless phones. We didn't have anything like that. We had no computers. We, we had no smartphones. Our, we had dumb phones. <laughs> all cords, you know, and... You couldn't get too far from the cord. Some of you look like you knew what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I guess it was probably maybe 10 or 15 years ago, uh, my youngest daughter taught me how to text. I had no idea. I had a little cell phone, well, a little Nokia is about this big, and, and uh, she was texting people, and I said, how do you do that? And so she taught me. She said, simple, Dad. You know, your kids always think it's simple. Bella said, one man's simple. One man is, it's a simple thing. The other man is just, uh, uh, uh. And I was, duh. So uh, she showed me how to text and type on my phone. And so I typed a message out. And I said, well, what do I do next? She said, Dad, it's so simple. You just hit the send button. And it was one of those kind of phones that when you hit the send button, the message just goes and disappears. And, it went, and I said, where did it go? It was gone. She said it went to the person that you sent it to. I was amazed. And I said, if I can send a text message, I can send the word of God. And that's what Jesus did. And Psalm 107 verse 20 says, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. So I was on good spiritual ground. So I not only learned how to text, but I learned how to send the word. And Jesus sent the word, and the man's military aid was healed the same hour. And he was maybe 20, 30 kilometers up the seacoast in the Tiberias area where the Roman garrison was stationed at that time. And Jesus said, man, you've got great faith. And so I learned how to send the word. Now, when you can't lay hands on people, you can send the word. The only difference is you don't touch them. Stand up again. Find somebody you've not yet prayed for tonight. Find somebody. Pair up again. Put your hands up. Except this time, you're not going to touch them. Do not touch them. Debbie, let her go. Do not. Young man, take your hands off that young woman. I know you've been wanting to touch her all night, but don't do it. Put your hands up. You're going to pray the same way. You're just not going to touch them. And you're going to be amazed what happens. Are you ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Begin. Don't touch them. You're sending the word. Lord, in Jesus' name, I send the word. I send the word. I send it, I send it, I send it for healing, for wholeness, for deliverance in the name of Jesus.
Amen. All right, now come back. Come back. Remember, it's not the length of your prayer. Okay? Now, watch this. How many of you can say, just now when someone sent the word to me, I felt the power of God. Put your hand up. Now look at that. Look at the hands. All right, find one more person. Find one more person. Somebody else, find one more person. Put your hands up. Do not touch them. Ma'am, let him go. Are you ready? On a count of three. One, two, three. Begin. In the name of Jesus, I send the word for healing from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. In the name of Jesus, be thou made whole, body, mind, and soul. Amen. Now, come back, come back, come back, come back. Come back. Remember, it's not the length of your prayer. Now, how many of you can say, just now, I felt the power of God when someone sent the word? Now, look at the hands. Hold the hands up high. Look at those hands. Now, everybody raise your right hand. Say, never again, never again. Will, I be will I be intimidated to lay hands on someone, hands on someone and, pray and pray the prayer of faith or send the word, send the word and pray the prayer of faith? They are different, they are different. but one's no better than the other. Well, They're just two different methods. Two different so I'll not, I'll not be intimidated in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Now somebody give him praise. Hallelujah. <laughs> seated. Now those are just two methods. And the circumstances will dictate the method that you use. Now there are other methods. And the Bible describes them. And if it's not in the Bible, leave it out. Amen. The Bible says that the Apostle Paul took handkerchiefs and aprons or what we would call cloths they were from his body, the Bible says, which means they probably were wrapped around his belt or they were inside his robe or somehow they were touching him or he was touching them. Amen. Tradition teaches, this is not in the Bible, but tradition, historians teach that there was, an, there was an epidemic in Ephesus and Paul could not go. And so he took handkerchiefs and aprons, what we would call cloths, and they were taken to Ephesus and laid upon the sick. Now that's what tradition teaches. That's not in the Bible, but it could very well have happened that way. Bottom line is, those handkerchiefs and aprons became prayer cloths. And the Bible says they were taken and they were laid upon the sick after they had been prayed over. And the sick were healed and the demonic spirits were driven out. That's Acts chapter 19. But make no mistake about it, there's no power in the cloth. This is just an ordinary cloth. There's nothing special about this cloth. Just, I always carry a handkerchief in my back pocket and there's nothing special about it. It's just a piece of cloth. Right. Right. But when I add my prayers to it, it becomes dangerous to the devil. Right. Now, I'm a, I'm a little wet here across my forehead and around my neck from preaching tonight. If I were to take this cloth and rub it across my forehead like this and wipe some of this sweat off, I could take this cloth down to the Cedar Rapids Police Department and they could do a check. They could run a DNA check and it wouldn't take them long to match it with me. And they would find that Richard Roberts has held this cloth. Well, I got news for you. When I lay my hands on this cloth, my spiritual DNA goes into this cloth. When it's laid upon the sick, people are going to get healed. 
but it's just an ordinary piece of cloth. There's nothing special about the cloth. The cloth is just a conduit. It's the carrier. It's carrying my prayers. And there are times when I can't lay hands on people and I can't send the word, but I can send them a prayer cloth that I have laid my hands on and prayed. I've sent out millions of them over the years. Remarkable healing testimonies all the time. Now, there's another method. It's the using of anointing oil. The Bible says in James chapter 5, let the elders anoint them with oil. And may they pray the prayer of faith, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. You'll find the anointing oil throughout the entire word of God. God said to Samuel, the prophet, fill your horn with oil and go. He anointed Saul to become the first king. He anointed David to become the second king. And the Bible says when the oil came upon them by Samuel's hands that they became like other men, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon them. There's something special about anointing oil. But it's just oil. There's nothing special about the oil. But it's the act of obedience. It's what the oil symbolizes. Now, I realize that there are some people who believe that a certain type of oil will work better. There are those who believe if you have oil that came from the Holy Land, from an olive tree that's near the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus wept with a certain aroma or fragrance, that it will work better. You can use 10W30. It's just oil. There's nothing special about the oil. Lindsay has a little can of of, of uh, 10 W30 in the in in the refrigerator, and she took it and anointed me with it the other night. It's just oil. There's nothing special about the oil. It's the act. It's the symbol. What it represents. The oil represents the healing power of God. Let the elders anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. As our children grew up, we would anoint them each night. We'd go into their bedrooms and we'd take a little oil. Lindsay always had some kind of oil in the house, you know, cooking oil or something, you know, Crisco or uh, Put a little bit on our hands and go in and anoint them with oil, make a little cross in their forehead. And if we would forget, from upstairs they'd call. They'd, they'd say, anoint, anoint, anoint. <laughs> And we, oh, we forgot to anoint them. We'd take some oil, you know, get oil in our hands and go up and we'd anoint them. We did that as they grew up. Uh, we'd anoint them with oil. Not because there was something special about the oil, but because it was a Bible thing to do. And sometimes I couldn't find any oil in the house. But I remembered that there's oil in my skin. And so I'd walk in their bedroom and I'd, I'd do this, you know. And I'd lay hands on them. <laughs> Just oil. Nothing special about the oil. The most effective, the most effective way is also in James 5, which says, pray one for another that you may be healed. That may be the most effective healing prayer that I ever pray is when I get people praying one for another. We had a woman who worked in our ministry for many years, and she uh, came down with cancer. And the doctor said, there's nothing that we can do medically. You need to go home and get your affairs in order. You're going to die. And she was heartbroken. She resigned her job and went home, as the doctor said. But the Lord spoke to her. He said, go out to our city and find as many people as you can who have been diagnosed with cancer and begin laying your hands on them and praying over them. And for several months, she did that as she had strength. And six months later, the doctor declared her cancer-free. And she unretired and came back to work <laughs> and lived several more years before she went home to be with the Lord, but not with cancer. Pray one for another that you may be healed. I used to think that it said in James 5, pray one for another that they may be healed. But that's not what the Bible says. It says pray one for another that you may be healed. In other words, your prayer becomes a seed 
not only for their healing, but then it can come back to you in the form of healing. So stand up one more time. Find one other person. And it doesn't matter to me whether you lay hands on them or whether you speak the word or whether you use a prayer cloth or whether you have some anointing oil, however you feel led of God. We're going to pray one more time and fulfill James 5, praying one for another that we may be healed. Are you ready? On a count of three, one, two, three, begin to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I send the word. I pray the prayer of faith for healing. For the Bible says the prayer of faith shall save the sick person, and the Lord will raise you up. And I pray the prayer of faith over you. I rebuke every sickness. I rebuke every disease. I rebuke every trace of cancer. I rebuke heart-related issues. I rebuke the problem with the blood pressure, with the blood sugar. Straighten up in the name of Jesus. Be healed. Blood pressure, blood sugar, regulate. Be normal. Loss of hearing, ears, open up. Cataract, glaucoma, blurred vision, come out. Ulcer, tumor, growth, cancer, malignancy, come out. I adjure you by Jesus' name, you turn loose of God's property. Every pain, every problem in your foot, your hip, your knee, your ankle, be healed. Every back pain, every neck pain, every shoulder pain, come out in the name of Jesus. I pray over every sickness and every disease and anything that's unlike God that is trying to attach itself to you. I curse it, I bind it, and I call you the healed of the Lord. From the crown of your head, even unto the soles of your feet. In Jesus' mighty name. Who's feeling the touch of God tonight? Put your hand up in the air. Who can tell you're feeling the touch of God tonight? Now raise your right hand and say this out loud. In the name of Jesus, I'll never be intimidated again. I won't be intimidated to lay hands on the sick, to speak the word according to the Bible, to use anointing oil, or a prayer cloth, or any other point of contact to help me to end the person to release their faith. But I remember that I am not the healer. I am just an instrument. I'm looking to God. He's my source. He's the source of healing. And so I look to Him, and I use my faith, and I believe God. In Jesus' name. Now, somebody give him praise. Come on, somebody give him praise tonight. Let me tell you. Let me tell you, if you, get, if you get what I'm teaching tonight, if you get it, it's worth my whole trip. It's worth everything. That you don't ever leave it just to the pastor and the evangelist. It's not scriptural. Every one of us is called to do it. You want to bring about revival? Start praying for the sick. Change their life. And it'll change yours too. Somebody give praise to the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. Now, tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, um, I know it's a Monday morning, but I'm only going to be here for these days. I don't know if I'll be back. I have no idea. I'm not in charge of that schedule. God's in charge of that. Tomorrow morning, we're starting with the second part. The second part is on the Holy Spirit.
clear up the fallacy that is in many churches around the world about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and about the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. The difference between your daily devotional prayer language and an operation of the gift of tongues. There's a major difference. And so that's what is on the schedule tomorrow. Tomorrow is the day of the Holy Spirit. We're going to start at what time? Ten. Not nine. Ten. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Because after a night like this, it takes me a while to kind of wind down before I can go to sleep. I'll be awake for a few hours tonight thinking about this and all that's going on. But that's part of my life. But I praise God for it. Did you get something tonight? Yeah. Did you? Did you get something? Yeah. Are you glad you came? Yeah. How many would rather be here than the best jail in Cedar Rapids? Yeah. All right, tomorrow, the Holy Spirit. Now, I uh, still have some books that are left over there. Uh, that they, You almost cleaned me out today, but you got more. There's still more over there. Praise God. God bless you, Pastor. I'm turning it back to you.